Hi, I'm Darren Peppard. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the Leaning Into Leadership podcast for episode number 83, where my guest on the show today is Lindsay Lyons. Now, maybe you don't know Lindsay, but I will tell you, Lindsay is an amazing human being, an amazing educator. She is an educational justice coach who helps schools and districts co-create feminist, anti-racist curricula that challenges, affirms, and inspires all students. Uh, Lindsay is a former New York City public school teacher. She holds a PhD in leadership and change, and she's the founder of the blog and podcast, Time for Teachership. Lindsay believes the secret sauce of educational equity is student voice. Lindsay and I sat down and had an amazing conversation recently, and you are going to hear it right on the other side of this. Today's episode is brought to you by Road to Awesome. Today, folks, I just want to talk about this real fast, and that is you got to send the right message when your school year starts. But how do you do that? What exactly are the words that you want your staff to hear? Well, I'll tell you what. I think it's words that focus on hope. It's words that focus on empowerment, and it's words that focus on staff knowing that they are seen, they are heard, they are valued, and they are trusted. That's the message that I'm bringing with Road to Awesome to schools all across the country this fall. I'd love to come to your school and have that same opportunity to visit with all of your staff to remind them of the incredible impact they have each and every day of the future of their community and for the future of our country. I'd love to have the opportunity to share some stories with them. Those moments in my life when two roads diverged and I had to make a choice. You know, that choice between focusing on all the things they're doing wrong or focusing on all the things they're doing right. I'd love to come to your school and I'd love for you to reach out and have a conversation with me. There's a link in the show notes that you can schedule some time or just simply send me a direct message or email me at darren at roadtoawesome.net. Together, let's get your school on the road to awesome. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get on to the episode. All right, Lindsay Lyons, welcome into the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. How are you, my friend? I am so good, Darren. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. This is this is super exciting. And um, I don't know how this will, will play out for both of us. I know we're kind of doing this as a home and home, if you will, in podcasts where, you know, I'm on your podcast, you're going to be on my podcast, that kind of thing. So um, super excited to talk. Oh, man, talk all kinds of things with you, entrepreneurship and uh, curriculum and, you know, teaching with, you know, that that mindset around racial justice and and wherever else this conversation might take us. So uh, just really quick, Lindsay, um, for my listeners, just tell them who you are, uh, a little bit about you, you know, that kind of stuff, like like you're in the elevator. Awesome. Yeah. So I call myself an educational justice coach because I feel like no name really fit what I did and centered justice in the way that that I do. Um, so I help schools and districts really co-create with students uh, curriculum units that really center activist projects. They advance um, kind of feminist, anti-racist practices and just better our communities. They really enable students to be leaders in their own right in the moment and not in some distant future. And I would add to that I haven't added this to my official bio yet, but I also think I'm learning the sense of student voice too from the perspective of a mom, which I is new for me in 2022. And so my kid is not quite a year old, and so I'm learning that journey that I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners have experienced themselves oh, in yeah. their lifetimes. You know, that just like causes this cosmic shift for you, you know, yes. when, uh, when you go from, from not being a parent to being a parent. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is really, um, you know, I mean, my, my one, so, uh, you know, we have, my wife and I have one kid. Uh, she's 22 at this point. So, I mean, it's, I'm much further removed from uh, from the one year old stage than you are, but um, I think that that lens of a parent just continues to grow for you, 
um, and just continues to, you know, you learn something new every single day as a parent and, you know, you have, you know, new excitements and new things that just terrify the living heck out of you. And, you know, those kinds of things, you know, that, you know, holy cow, my kid's going to go out into the world and, you know, some of those kinds of things. But you know, Absolutely. anyway, that's... I was talking to someone yesterday, too, who is in curriculum design and leads a department of social studies teachers and was saying, you know, it's so interesting. His kid is a few months older than mine. It's so interesting when we watch our kids grow up as as young kids and we see how they learn and experience the world. And that is not at all how we teach. Like we teach in this yeah. very prescribed manner. And it's like, no, that kid has to fail, come back to it and get excited, be curious. Like it is fascinating. Yeah. It really, it really is, and that's oh my gosh, we could we could run after that for hours. Um, just how how we you know how we just continue to cling to this to this old model, and, and not that everybody is is clinging to it, but I think it's still maybe deeply rooted in in our system, just yeah. on a national basis, not even like classroom to classroom. But so so tell me this: this is I think where where I want to start. So you're you're a curriculum coach, which I think is such a cool thing. Um, I am, I think you know this about me, but I'm such an advocate for coaching, whether that's, you know, like I do with coaching leaders or, you know, coaching, coaching classroom teachers, like, like our mutual friend, Ashley Hubner does, or coaching around curriculum. Um, coaching to me is just, oh, it's huge. It's just so huge, but I'm curious, you know, why curriculum? What took you in that direction? Oh my gosh. I don't think anyone's asked me this question ever, which is... You are kidding. There's no way. There's no way nobody's asked you that question. Well, cool. I'm glad to be the first. Yeah. I'm so excited to answer this. So I think for me, it is what... like I think number one, got into teaching because I love... Uh, the concept of of student leadership and student voice and advancing justice and how do we how do we enable students to be leaders and and create our better world in in the now. So that connection with students and and that justice centered piece is is probably number one. But a very close second, number two, is how I as a teacher can design the space for that to happen. Like what choices do I make that hooks a student in? Like. I have so many decisions to make around, you know, I have 100 students who are going to experience this lesson or however many. How do I connect with each one of those 100 students in a way that gets them so excited to do this 10 week unit or something, right? That's a huge like goal and also so exciting if I can if I can hit it, right? And so I think that kind of challenge, I always love a good challenge. I'm a marathoner as well. So I mean, I think that's just kind of like in what I do. But I think the challenge is exciting and seeing the joy and excitement on the student's face. It's like, we're all just pumped. We're all just joyful in the learning experience. So I think that's why curriculum, because it enables us to have that joy. You know, I think that's one of the cool things about being an entrepreneur and, you know, folks, I guess for, for maybe a little bit of clarity or transparency, uh, Lindsay and I are also both part of a mastermind group uh, of education entrepreneurs. And so that's that's actually how, how the two of us have connected and, and built a pretty good relationship. But um, I, I find it fascinating that, you know, you look at our group, just, just that group alone, and each one of those individuals are absolutely chasing the thing that lights them up. You know, uh, there's the video piece to this, you know, you and I can see each other, um, you know, other people are just hearing it and they can hear it, the excitement and the passion in your voice. But I'm telling you folks to, to look at Lindsay when she talks about this. She just, I mean, Lindsay, you like glow, like you're like, just like, bah, you know, exploding talking about curriculum. Love so it. I guess I just, I just want to push harder on that a little bit more. I mean, so, so you've chosen to go into this work, like yeah. when you're working with schools, when you're working with districts, like, what is the thing that that you walk away and go, yes, this is why I love what I do? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I was just meeting with someone, actually, a former colleague. We used to share room together. We're, we're proposing for NCTE, the conference coming up. And we're like, how do we bring the thing we do, you know, to to other teachers? And what is that joy? Like, where where does that come from? Where have we experienced it? How do we get other people to do it? And and I think so much of it is like what, what she was saying, my friend Kalud, she was like, I had a student recently challenge me. Like I said something and the student pushed back and said, well, you know, in this language, blah, 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 blah. And she was like, yes, do more of that. Like I think whenever a student can come up with an innovative solution 
to a problem or to critique, offer a critique of like a, a current take on an issue or or even like a piece of media. Like we, we've we used um, critical media analysis as kind of like a gateway to student engagement in the multiple literacies. And when they can take like a music video that's popular and offer like this novel critique of it or something, just like student creativity is so phenomenal. When we can create space for students to create and innovate and critique in that way, like that's to me what is like, oh my gosh, yes. Like I want all the students to prove me wrong or critique me or push back, expand my ideas and ultimately take our society as a whole forward in ways that us adults, we're so in the box all the time, right? We've been trained yeah. to do this. We need to let the kids take us out of that box. So I'm curious. So, you know, maybe there's a classroom teacher that's listening to this right now and they're like, hold on, just hold <laughs> on here, Lindsay. I'm not junking my lesson plans just just so they can tear apart rap music. And I know that's not what you're saying. So so I'm kind of playing a little devil's advocate here, though. So when you're working with teachers one on one, I mean, like, like, what is that initial step that I can take? I'm not saying, you know, toss the curriculum binder in the trash and let's start fresh. But what are some things that teachers can do like tomorrow? You know, I mean, they're, they're or even today. So they're like in their car and they're driving to work right now and they're listening <laughs> to Lindsay Lyons. Like, what is something that they can do to kind of help? I mean, because you're talking about student agency is what you're really talking about. Yep. I mean, how, how how do they get there? How do they take like yeah. just the one step to to at least feel what, what that looks like? Yeah. So that is a tough question. I will answer it in the best way I can. So I think the biggest question for me, if you're driving on your way to work now, okay, let's say you have a lesson plan in mind. You've, you've scoped it all out. Ask yourself in your lesson plan today out of let's say your class is an hour just because math is easier that way. Are you talking for a max of 15 minutes during that class? Are students, therefore, talking and creating for 75% of the time, 45 minutes out of the 60 minute period? Like, if not, where can you take a step back? Where can you offer more student voice and choice? Where could you, instead of talking at, right, co-create with or offer a question that takes students down a path and like brings them back in. One of my favorite things to do, this is great if you are driving to work and don't have a lesson plan right now, is start a circle <laughs> protocol. I've definitely been there on those days. <laughs> oh yeah, um, me too. Yeah. That's why I'm laughing. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. I remember those you, days. If you create a student uh, student-centered practice I call circle. Um, some people call it different things, but it, it's typically literally sitting in a circle, no desks, just chairs. That's really nice because I think there's a vulnerability present where you can't like hide a phone under a desk and like, you know, sit in a circle, maybe have a centerpiece. There's a lot of pieces to this and I and I have some resources I can definitely share with your listeners for free if, if, if that is of interest. But ask a couple key questions and literally pass a talking piece, maybe in the, the uh, time of COVID, you're like, miming, you know, passing a talking piece and not touching something, but literally give each student a chance to to answer a question. What that means is that you as a teacher have to ask a really good question, right? That is totally relevant, open ended. But that itself will open up so much. And if you literally have no lesson plan, you have no idea what content to teach today. I would say start with a connection builder, like the story of my name. So the question being, what is the story of my name? And just have students like talk about what their name means to them or why their parents named them that or people can't pronounce my name like here's how it's pronounced or you know whatever such a good relationship builder and that's the foundation with which all the good student voice stuff is built on i think oh absolutely i mean yeah oh boy you're you're just ooh, you're singing my tune right there because <laughs> it is it is about relationships right i mean I, I talk about it here on the podcast all the time that we're in the people business so um you know i, I really like what you said there Oh, man, like multiple things I want to unpack there. Um, number one, you know, you opened with, you know, if if 75% of the time it isn't the students doing the work, then, you know, what, what are we really focusing on? And what it made me think about are, you know, those two big words, teaching and learning. You know, teaching doesn't have to be stand and deliver. In fact, it shouldn't be. Um, and then number two, the, the, the thing that I'm, this is where I want to go a little deeper, is just around asking good questions. I think this is one of those big shifts, really big shifts in classroom facilitation. You know, it isn't necessarily that, you know, today, so I was, I was a middle school and then high school science teacher. So, you know, today, instead of, you know, I'm going to deliver a lecture on, 
how how the muscular system interacts with uh, with the skeletal system in my anatomy and physiology class, for example. Perhaps it could be, you know, what are two really good questions that I could ask? Or maybe let's take it even a step further. If, if you have the relationships already in place, maybe it's even what are two really good questions kids could ask about that relationship, that right? Is- so, yeah, yeah. So I I think that's – let's 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 just go a little bit more with that, with, you know, building on – looking at your topic, whatever the topic is, whatever the standard is that you're working toward, what, what are some good ways for teachers to, like, like even good like question stems that they could use or ways to get to asking those good questions? Yeah, such a good question. So so in terms of the student piece, I think being able to have a really good hook. So sometimes, oftentimes, I will actually use a current event that I have identified that represents the theme or the content that we're studying more broadly in the unit. And I will use that as a hook. And then I will throw that to the students. We read it together. We watch a short video clip of something. And then I will use circle protocol actually as as an example and pass around the talking piece and every student gets to ask a question. And then we can kind of organize it together and say, okay, well, here's a common theme I'm seeing across the questions. Maybe we each star and the one with the most stars, we actually pursue that. And that becomes a whole little inquiry loop, right? Where we're like, okay, tomorrow we're going to go try to answer this question, right? So that's that's one kind of inquiry focused idea with the students asking the question. For a teacher, I like to frame each unit with a driving question. And I think it's a little bit different than an essential question. Essentials, very broad. Driving is specific to the unit, contextualized. And the, the project, like the summative assessment is actually answering that driving question, which helps for alignment. It helps for planning more efficiently. And so I've come up with a couple driving question frames that I've played with over the years and just feel like really great uh, to me. But I'd love some feedback. And if people have more, I'd love to hear more because I'm always collecting them. Um, But like, so one is, uh, does like a text, a person, an idea do X or Y? So for example, the Media Critique Project, does this text could be any text? So there's a lot of student voice there. Does this music video, does this article interrupt or reproduce oppression? And so then they can take a stance. Oh, well, this music video actually reproduces oppression because blah, 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 right? And they can practice citing evidence. Uh, Another one I absolutely love, what's the formula for blank? And so this is a creation activity where students would say, for example, a math class, what's the formula for the best basketball player of all time, right? So is LeBron James the best? Well, how would we compare people using a formula? And does justice matter, right? So like another way to bring in justice here is like, yeah, we could we could look at all their rebounds, their assists, but like, are they a good person off the court? Like what's the number of times that they have, you know, uh, been a part of like a, a, an abusive partner relationship or something, right? Like that, that matters, right? Like should that be part of the conversation of the formula? Like there's so many ways that we could get students to like create um, in this way. So like another one is what would it look like if... So what would an equitable representative district map look like if we're if we're doing like a geometry unit with social studies interdisciplinarily, like talking about gerrymandering? OK, we can talk about the problem. We can identify it as a problem. But that feels very stifling to know that like injustice exists and we oh, it's terrible. Like, well, what can we do about it? Like, what's a better way? So the question invites those solutions versus what's the answer to the question that has a definitive answer? It's like opening up the possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, when when we move away from close ended types of questions, you know, oh, the you know x equals five, not that we shouldn't be doing those problems, but maybe that was a bad example. But <laughs> you know, to to those ones that have a lot more open ended, you know, types of uh, types of responses, and and that can honestly, you know, even spark, you know, good debate within a classroom for kids to really talk about. You know, well, no, I feel this way. I mean, you know, you mentioned, you know, a formula for the greatest basketball player of all time. Well, okay, well, I don't think this should be a part of the equation, and here's why. Well, I think it. Is, I think this should be a part, and here's why. And you yeah. know, actually being able to, regardless of the topic, being able to, you know, formulate an argument, defend an argument, but also listen to yeah. other arguments. You know, not just listen to disprove, but actually listen to understand other people's perspectives. We will return to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast in just a moment. But first, let me ask you a question. Have you ever said to yourself, man, I should write a book? Well, if you have, then let me ask you another question. What's holding you back? What keeps you from taking the step that moves you from, I have an idea about a book, to, 
I am a published author. From experience, I would bet it's probably you're wondering who would even want to read a book that I wrote. Maybe you're questioning the idea. Is it unique enough? Is it valid enough? Is it good enough to be a book worthy of having published? Hey, as a best-selling author myself, I can tell you most writers have had the exact same feelings at some point in time during their writing journey. Here at Road to Awesome, we believe in cultivating leaders by elevating voices and promoting positivity. And a part of that work is publishing books for educators by educators. Go to roadtoawesome.net and hit the contact us button to set up a free, no obligation conversation about your book idea. Hey, educators, we've all had incredible experiences. We all have amazing stories and every one of them deserves to be told. Go to roadtoawesome.net, hit the contact us button. Let's have that conversation about your book idea. And now back to the Leaning into Leadership podcast. You and I had a conversation recently, and you talked about myth busting around teaching related to racial justice. Yeah. And I think this, it was just so fascinating. And I, I wish we could have just like recorded that conversation that we had. So not that I want to reproduce or, re, you know, recreate a conversation, but let, let's just maybe, you know, jump off from, from that particular phrase, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe even just talk about what are some of the myths around you know, teaching for racial justice. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one, and I'll just start with this one because because it relates to what you were just saying about listening. So there is a myth, I think, that we have to be neutral or that we have to hear all sides of, a, of an argument. And I would myth bust that in saying, um, you know, we don't want to trivialize or erase injustice and we don't want to dehumanize a group of people. What I mean by that is if there is a person coming in, a student coming in and kind of spewing um, hatred, right? That's not, a, that's not something that we have to honor in a conversation. So I think some people avoid questions of racial justice and discussing this in a class because they're like, oh, well, that kid, you know, their parents have told them this. And so they're going to repeat this in the class. And then like, I have to hear it. I have to, I have to make space for it. And we don't. Yeah. And I think that's part of... Um, having the, the agreements, for example, circle is a great opportunity. That practice is so core to so much that I do. But if you have a circle on like, how do we communicate? What are our classroom agreements? You don't even have to do it at the start of the year. You could do, you could do it at the start of the year. You could do it in the middle of the year. You could do it on a random Wednesday. But like, I think the conversation about how we communicate kind of proceeds or needs to proceed all of these, you know, topics of conversation about justice. But I do think that's really important. We don't have to hear all sides and we don't have to hear and make space for like inaccuracies. I think that's the other thing is there's a lot of non-factual information. Like it's just completely untrue that is kind of out in social media. And, and of course, kids are going to pick up on it and repeat it. And it's nothing against that kid, right? It's, it's our job as an educational institution to be like, well, let's examine that claim, right? We are uh, an institution that where facts matter, and so I love the distinction there's uh, scholars, McAvoy and Hess talk about settled empirical issues. So these are things where there's like, there are facts. For example, there, there's a fact that uh, maternal mortality is about four times higher for black women than white women. That's just like a fact where you could say like racism is alive and well in this specific space. It's factually proven. Now, how we fix that, how we advance justice is something we can debate. So we all want a better society. How do we get there? And so that's something that we can answer. We can open up to multiple answers. And so I think that's one one piece. That's one myth <laughs> to share. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I think that's really powerful, too. You know, I, I think there are, you know, certainly... Um, people that are that are in our classrooms today, uh, leaders in our schools, leaders in our districts, who really would struggle with what you just talked about. Yeah, you know, I mean, do do I have to honor all voices? You know, how how do I even a, a approach this when, you know, when when a situation happens or when there is something that you know maybe it's a you know a kid saying something or you know there's you know some behavior in a community or something that happens on a national level that you know clearly is related to uh, to race how do how do we really handle those things and i really appreciate that you say that that we 
you know, we don't have to make space for everything. Now, that doesn't also, uh, and I, I don't think what you're saying is, you know, we get to pick and choose, but that we need to stay to things that really fit on a factual basis or that give us an opportunity to examine and say, okay, let's really find out, is this true or is this something that has played out in the media or played out on social media or something that is not grounded in truth? Right. And I think student voice is a wonderful opportunity. Like you were saying, like, we don't have to, like, pick and choose. I think I think what you're kind of getting at there is, like, this idea of, like, we are not indoctrinating. I think it's a, it's a word that's used a lot, right? We're exactly. not indoctrinating students into our beliefs. Student voice is a wonderful way to, like, counteract that myth because you're like, well, I'm opening it up for or I'm creating a unit around pursuing justice. So what's the best way to make a better society, for example, would be like a broad question. And then students can choose whatever's important to them. So someone might be really interested in like combating eating disorders or combating depression or, um, you know, uh, police brutality or like there's so many things. There's a range of what uh, students could choose, but they're choosing it. You're not choosing the topic for them. And so I love that as an avenue. And I also want to say one thing I, I didn't say and I, I think is related is that we never want students to be fearful or embarrassed or fearful like they're going to be punished for sharing their ideas. And so that's one thing, again, that we want to create this space where if a student has heard a bunch of things at home and is coming in and sharing them and it's 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 not like it, it doesn't uphold dignity, it's not factual, whatever, like we never want to like shame the kid if they're unintentionally just kind of right. parroting. Um, we want to create that community where like, of course, you have the opportunity to share, but we're going to interrogate these ideas through the lens of justice and facts. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, to me, you know, I, I go back to, as we're talking about this, not necessarily a, re a race related issue, but <sighs> political division issue. Mm -hmm. um, as as a superintendent, um, prior to the 2020 election, um, uh, our seniors at, at, at our high school in the district were allowed to paint their parking spaces. Well, two kids mm -hmm. parked next to each other, they painted a Trump 2020 mega blah, 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 you know, political ad basically. And regardless the political leanings of the community, there were people who spoke out about this. Well, you know, the school can't endorse this and this and this and this. And the position that I took with that was, you know, what I really want our kids to be able to do is to have good political discourse. Um, I, you know, our, our, our teacher who taught civics, you know, reached out to me right away. He's like, you know, this isn't okay. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I understand that. However, is this the opportunity for you to open the conversations in your classroom and to be able to help teach kids how we have appropriate political discourse? Uh, because I think that's a skill that for whatever reason, we seem to have lost it as a society and, and, and being able to have good discourse to not necessarily agree with each other, but to be able to understand and hear each other. And ultimately, if we don't agree, that's fine. We walk away without name calling or bullying or, you know, anger, you know, and, and hate and all those other things that come with, with the division that we deal with. So, um, I think I'm kind of chasing a squirrel here. And in fact, I don't even remember where I was trying to go with, with this particular point. But I do think that the more we, we give opportunities for our kids to be able to have good discourse, to me, I mean, that, that might be the most important work we can do with our kids right now. Yeah, I think two things I want to say about that. One is that when we push kids away from having the conversations in schools that are typically... Um, I, I, I hate when people declare safe spaces because you can never declare a safe a space is safe. You like students have individual perceptions of safety, but they are typically safer than many like for example online spaces. You know, I, there is so much like white supremacy radicalization happening on YouTube, for example, of like white teenage boys. This has been like a documented effect because the white teenage boys are not able to talk about race in spaces like school. And so they find those conversations somewhere else. And often it's way more dangerous for them and societally, you know, to be part of those conversations there. So I, I do think there's a value in making space for it. And the other thing is, if you have a culture of restorative practices, um, holistically at the school and district level, I think it's much easier to have these conversations because if harm is done, you have a framework for repairing it. But also 
part of how I used to do restorative practices with my students was I would I help them identify and and also for an adult as well. I think it's important to identify like what's the underlying need that's not being met. So is it belonging, autonomy, survival, like enjoyment or fun? Like typically it's one of those four is what I've found. Um, And I think that's like an adaptation of Glasser's five. I just like the acronym base. So that's how I remember it. But, you know, if we can think about that, like, oh, okay, you want more safety. You want, you're in survival mode. I I hear that. You want an authority figure who's going to lead you towards safety and put in these bounds. Okay, I can connect with that feeling of safety. Here's how I feel unsafe uh, by the rhetoric that's being like speaking by this politician or something, you know, and that's like a common underlying point that we don't often get to in discourse. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so let's, let's use that topic to, to kind of jump into another one. I know this is something that's really, really a passion of yours and that's adaptive leadership. So, I mean, obviously, you know, we're talking about leadership here on the leaning into leadership podcast. That's what we do. Um, but again, in, in a recent conversation, you talked a lot about um, just this passion you have for adaptive leadership. It, talk just a little bit about that, and then I mean, we're going to see where it, where it takes us. But um, talk to me about why that's something that's important to you. Yeah, I think so many of the problems that I like grappling with, things around justice, what we have seen historically that has not worked to address them are what um, Heifetz Linsky and Grashow talk about, these are the three adaptive leadership scholars who have written some really cool books on adaptive leadership. They talk about them as technical uh, fixes to adaptive challenges. So for example, we have uh, an issue of um, like systemic racism is present in a school. What do we do? Oh, we do a quick two hour workshop PD on this book study, the end, you know what I mean? Like, or, or, um, you know, st- there there are uh, a lot of our black students are falling behind in ELA. So here is this uh, great reviewed Ed Reports curriculum. Teachers, you're going to get a PD on how to implement it. The end, right? And so we never kind of get at the depth of what is what's going on. What's like the deep thing that is happening? And so um, these authors typically talk about this from the perspective of like what is the habit, belief, or loyalty that underlies the challenge. And I really like that language because if we think about what are we loyal to, right? What is the deeply held belief that we have? If we can get at that, like it is uncomfortable. It takes a while. It takes, again, those um, discussion agreements, like that foundational kind of perceived safety in a space. But if we can get there, we are going to have a far different conversation than if we were just to say, okay, we're going to do this quick to RPD the end. And I, I think the best illustration of this has been, I was doing work for um, DESE, which is this the Department of Ed in Massachusetts, um, as a consultant and a, at a turnaround district. And we were working on, they identified the behavior of students wearing hats, hoods, and earbuds and not taking them off as like the biggest problem. And they they got to this point of like, okay, hats, hoods, and earbuds, how do we solve it? Okay, well, we're going to solve it by making teachers, I like take off, like pause what they're doing in hallway monitoring and like take off a student's hood, like have that happen immediately, 100% compliance, that's the way forward. And we're going to train everybody on how to do this. And we're going to like, it's going to happen. And I, I wasn't like, I think, confident enough in my like first two months of working with them to be able to do what I wanted to do, which was pause the conversation and ask, what is the deeply held belief that we as educators are holding about those hoods, hats, and earbuds? Because that would have led us down a very different path, I think. So why are those things threatening to us, to our authority? Where does this come from? What would happen if we let a kid walk down the hood, the hall with a hood on and we had a pleasant conversation with them and it wasn't adversarial? Could that actually result in more learning for the student the rest of the day? More peace in the hallways? Like, we just never had that conversation and we're often unwilling to have those conversations and therefore the problem just continues and we never fix it. And we're just kind of stuck in that loop of, of discipline issue territory. Oh, absolutely. And you know, I'm, yeah. I'm flashing back to two different things when, when you're talking about the hats and the hoods and that kind of thing, you know, as, as a classroom teacher, um, our, our leadership team decided that, you know, what they were going to do with, with the hood thing, you know, reti- they were tired of telling kids to take their hoods down. So they just started suspending kids and they, I don't know, they spent like 125 oh. kids. It was front page news and, you know, made, I think the, you know, the Arizona Republic. And it's like, 
okay, clearly that wasn't the right answer. Um, you know, and, 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 and also, you know, something I talk about all the time, you know, it's kind of, kind of my, where my, my two roads divided, um, leading to the road awesome seriously was a staff meeting on what are we gonna do about hats and cell phones? And, you know, I don't think we ever got to, you know, what is it that really is that, that deep core belief Mm -hmm. rather than, oh no, they're just challenging our authority. Well, we are the adults and we are going to we're going to tell them what they're going to do and i think that's one of those biggest biggest challenges and and really to me when you know listening to you talk about adaptive leadership a lot of it too is you're talking about change theory and what yeah. really can drive sustainable change as opposed to you know okay um i looked at our math scores and we're not very good here and therefore this is the solution as opposed to let's really um, uh, my, my, my friend, Eric Bowles with, uh, CEE in Washington, they, they drive that work with data through, you know, kind of a, so what, now what type of, yep. uh, type of protocol. So, okay. So what, that's what the data says. Why, why do we think that let's really dig into and find what, what are the core beliefs we're really holding deep? Not, not the ones at the surface. Oh, our kids are lazy. Our kids don't take the test serious, mm-hmm. whatever. What are the real deep beliefs that we carry? Um, Again, to me, that's a lot of that is just so deeply set in in change theory, and I'm and yeah. I'm, I'm curious your take on that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, yeah, totally, totally related. And I think another piece of that too is like thinking about this concept of like change as resistance as loss is another piece that High Fit Scratch and Linsky talk about in adaptive leadership. So this idea of like if we can acknowledge that there is a loss that happens um, when we are going through change. If we could just acknowledge the human component of like, I feel like there's a little bit of a, of a loss of the identity I held as authority figure or a teacher is this, right? We were mostly, most of us were trained in grad school to become teachers as like, you know, don't smile till December and like you are the authority maker and like all of these things. <laughs> right. Like it, if we have to let go of that, that can be hard. But if we acknowledge that loss, Right? And we say, yeah, there's a loss of something here, but we're also building something better. And also this this idea of buy-in, I think is a huge thing leaders talk to me about um, and want coaching on, like how do I get buy-in from teachers? And I often say like, if you include teachers in the process and even if you, even more so if you include students in the process, so again, that student voice connection and you have a shared leadership model, you don't even need that buy-in. You don't even need buy right. into your vision because it's not your vision. It's a co-created vision. And so I think that's a huge part of like adaptive leadership, adaptive solutions come from that shared solution, not something that's top. Yeah. Down. Yeah. We said, we set out at one point in time when, uh, when we really first started changing our culture, the, the school where, where I was the high school principal. Um, but I think I, well, in fact, I know I was an AP at the time and, you know, we had a real struggle with it, with attendance and we had these beliefs as adults, well, this is why, you know, especially third period, man, our third period attendance is atrocious. And this is why, you know, and finally, you know, we're like, how about, how about we pull a group of kids together? And we pulled a group of like 125 kids together and, you know, did like some different workshopping and then just really dug into it. And, oh my God, Lindsay, we were so wrong. What we thought was the problem was not the problem. We weren't even close, you know, I mean, especially third period, our kids were skipping because they were hungry, you know, and, and it went back to, we thought that because we had an issue with trash in the mornings, that the solution was let's stand at the front door and make them throw away their trash on their way in. Okay, we're talking high school kids at you know seven fifty in the morning. They're rolling in with their Starbucks and whatever breakfast bar or whatever's in their hand. We make them throw it away. Well, what happens? They're hungry and they're irritable. They didn't get their coffee. They didn't get their breakfast. Third period. I'm out. <laughs> I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go get my lunch early. Well. So we just started changing some of our behaviors. It was amazing the change that happened because we we had to let go of what we thought the problem was. Yes. You know? I mean yes. that's and that's so hard for adults, right? Because it we really cool. think, like you said, like we're the authority figure. We know what kids need. Yeah, well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I actually, I have an example about that too. I don't know if we have enough time for another example. Go for it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. go for it. I think connecting back to that, that attendance issue, connecting back to curriculum, for me, that's actually one of the reasons that I kind of doubled down on my love for curriculum that I initially had was because I was teaching in a school where we had 
I would say like maybe 10% attendance in my classes, maybe. It was not well attended. The school eventually got shut down. Uh, you know, there was maybe one student in in my, my classes at the time. Um, sometimes the roster was as big as 35. I mean, this was like, what is going on here? And so we didn't actually have the students to be able to ask the question of why is there a attendance issue? Because no one's coming yeah. to school. So what I ended up doing was I took a bunch of students, well, I was given a bunch of students, uh, and these were all the students who didn't attend at all, um, you know, maybe like once a week kind of, they, they were present in the school, but not heavily attending. Their grades were low. They usually had IEPs. Um, and, and the principal was like, here you go. This is the class you're going to teach. Make it whatever you want. And it was the best gift I had because I was able to create a class about gender studies. So I created a feminist course. It actually was so rigorous. It became a college credit course the next year. And these students who didn't show up at all to their regents courses, where it was kind of like the quote unquote drill and kill model, like, you know, like just multiple choice, all the things, testing, testing. They got to do research projects. They wrote five page essays when I had never seen more than a paragraph before in my life from them. They, the attendance was close to 95%. Like this was a class that just through the grapevine, people were like, oh, we actually get to do this fun stuff. Oh, we get to do a slam poetry piece like that. Yeah, like I'll be there tomorrow. It was amazing. And so I do think that curriculum, when you don't get to ask the students directly because they're not even present, being able to yeah. experiment yourself with like, well, what if we tried this approach? Like, what if we did this? Like, what if we made it really, really cool? And like outside the bounds of whatever we thought school was supposed to be, maybe that will work, right? And then maybe we'll have enough interest and attendance that we can then generate more solutions with the students who are studying the con. I just love that so much. I mean, those, <laughs> yeah, those are the classes that, you know, I mean, I obviously I went into all my classes as, uh, you know, as a principal and that kind of thing. But those are the types of classes that were always just so much fun to be in. Yeah. Because if you really want to see, I mean, you really want to see rigor and relevance in action. You really want to see engaged students. I mean, like it, everybody asks me this, you know, when it, no matter what school or district or whatever, you know, that, that I'm working with or whatever will eventually get to the conversation of what does student engagement really look like? How do we define it and how do we measure it? Because leaders want to know that, you know, yeah. I mean, how do we really say, hey, this is what engagement looks like? Go to those classes yep. and then ask the kids, you know, ask the kids, why are you so dialed into this? What is yep. it that gets you going on this? And your kids will tell you. And that is how you then develop that metric to decide what relevant or what rather engagement really looks like. Because that's... Yeah. Yeah. You, you know it when you feel it. You know yeah. it when you see it, you know. And, you know, the whole engagement versus compliance thing, we could chase that one for hours too. That's that's not where we're going to go right now. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of things I want to get to really quick before we, we get to my final question. And uh, and that's first, the uh, I, I, I would be – I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about it. So let's talk a little bit about Time for Teachership, your podcast um, on the Teach Better Podcast Network, uh, just like Leaning Into Leadership is. Um, tell me a little bit about the podcast, or uh, I know about the podcast, but but tell tell my listeners a little bit about it and why they should dial in. It is such a good podcast. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Darren. Yeah, it has been so fun to do. So I basically alternate between a solo, kind of like a how-to episode, which is typically, I mean, I've done episodes on shared leadership, like we just talked about adaptive leadership, curriculum design, those kinds of things. Um, Very much about teaching and leading for justice. And as leaders, how do we, um, the reason, actually, let me back up. The reason I called it Time for Teachership was one, because it sounded super cool. And I was like, oh, it's like teacher and leadership intersection. And it does. Then I Googled it. Thank you. (laughs) Then I Googled it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is actually an academically researched thing like teachership literally is uh, an academic phenomenon someone has developed or or defined as like the intersection of teaching and leadership where leaders are in the classrooms more and more and more as instructional leaders and teachers have opportunities to get outside of their class and be leaders in the space of curriculum development and instruction to their peers um, both in the school and outside of the school so I'm like that is what I want for the world of education Uh, and so I get to interview now I'm really hyper specialized in like curriculum leaders. So assistant superintendents of curriculum and instruction, curriculum department heads. Um, I'm doing a really cool series this summer. So I think this will air before the summer. This summer, I'm going to try to do a series where teachers come on. Actually, we have someone else from our entrepreneur group. I think Debbie uh, Tannenbaum is going to come on and do an episode like this, um, where we are in the 30 minute episode, literally creating a unit from scratch 
using the justice-centered process and model. And so it'll include a lot of student voice and things like that. So it'll it'll literally model what it will look like to coach someone through. So an instructional coach or leader can actually listen in and hear like 10 different examples of what this looks like. Um, I also have a student episode coming up. I'm doing a conference here in Massachusetts where it's like a youth DEI conference. And so part of the conference uh, session is going to be students recording their own audio and creating a podcast episode. And then I'm going to air it on my podcast. So that's going to come in the spring as well. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Oh my gosh, just so many awesome things happening um, on your podcast. That's fantastic. You can find Lindsay's podcast um, on uh, teachbetter.com uh, forward slash podcasts. You'll see the time for teachership. I think actually the last time I scrolled, like it was right next to leaning into leadership. So there you go. Perfect. Just just bang, bang. Click on both of them. Listen, listen, listen like crazy. Um, that type of thing. So so let's go ahead. Um, before I ask you my, my final question, people are going to want to have a conversation with you. How do they get in touch with you, Lindsay? Yeah, lindsaybethlyons.com has all the things. There's like free resources. You can literally sign up on my calendar for just like a 20-minute chat with me. I love nothing more than talking to people and brainstorming curriculum and leadership ideas. Um, I will also, Darren, if it's okay with you, I can offer a link that you can put in the show notes or on your blog post or something uh, yeah. for people. There's several resources that I have that I'd love to share for free uh, related to things we talked about today. So I think also go to the show notes. And then once you sign up for that, it'll put you on my email list as as well. So you'll get a weekly email from me. That's perfect. I will hyperlink all of that stuff in the show notes, um, along with um, all the social media and all that kind of stuff. So you can get connected with Lindsay as much as possible. You definitely want to do that if that hasn't already become evident by listening to this podcast. So <laughs> Uh, Lindsay, the title of the podcast is Leaning into Leadership. And this, I ask everybody this as a last question. Um, right now, Lindsay, what are you doing to lean into leadership? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, in addition to being a parent, which I think is constantly a journey of leaning into leadership oh, in some yeah. form or another, um, I would say I'm working with one team right now that is kind of been uh, voluntold to work with me. And so that's always a unique challenge. And so I'm really trying to channel the shared and adaptive leadership pieces of that to try to show what is possible and live into like a dream of what education can be to try to get through that initial kind of hurdle of why are we doing this? So that is kind of my leadership challenge at the moment. I'm really trying to channel all that stuff that we talked about today and actually put it into practice. Oh, I love it. That is all just absolutely outstanding. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining me here on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Darren. This was so fun. Excellent conversation there with Lindsay Lyons. Folks, make sure you hit the links in the show notes. Go check out what Lindsay has for you. There's a special free resource in there for you, as well as all of her contact information. Lindsay is an absolutely amazing human being. Make sure that you are following Lindsay Lyons. And now it's time for a pep talk. Today on the pep talk, I want to give a shout out to my friend Don Epps. Don is a superintendent in Kansas. And many of you probably follow Don on social media. You know that he is the absolute king of chasing greatness. He's a high energy guy. He's an incredible leader. And I watched a video of his today where he talked about conquering Snow Hill, a hill in Kansas that apparently he has been trying to conquer since he was a kid. And today he finally made it. He got to the top of the hill on that bike. And I'm telling you, the energy he has when he talks about it in the video is infectious. Now, I share this shout out and use this for our pep talk because there's always going to be that challenge in our life that maybe we think could be insurmountable. Maybe we think, oh, I don't know if I'll ever quite conquer that hill. But you know what? When you stick with it, when you keep your nose to the grindstone and you just keep moving, eventually you start to believe in yourself. You start to know, hey, I belong here. I can do this. I'm going to be at the top of the hill. And oh man, I cannot wait until I see the view from the top. Get out there and conquer those challenges, folks. Don't be afraid. Failure is not the end of the road. Failure is just you learning how to get to the top of that hill. Thanks for joining me this week on Leaning Into Leadership. Have a road to awesome day. Thank you for listening to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast brought to you by Road to Awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership. <laughs>